Carl, as you were sharing about how those furry friends can get into our lives and uh, get to be pretty significant and important to us, we uh, uh, had to put our dog down. It's now probably 12, 15 years ago, but uh, he had been with us for like 16 years, and uh, uh, it was uh, very difficult, and uh, it was right about the time that I was getting ready to retire from full-time pastoral ministry, and we talked about whether we should replace him or not. And uh, we had a little Shih Tzu, and he was one of those lap dogs that followed you everywhere and uh, wanted to be right where you were. And so uh, we said, well, you know, we're getting ready to retire. We probably want to do a little more traveling, and it's kind of a, a little bit of a problem sometimes to find somebody to dog sit and all of that. So we said we wouldn't. And uh, so we were talking about it one day, and uh, uh, Barbie said to me, she said, well, she said, you know, that's probably the right decision. But if anything ever happened to you, I'd get another dog. <laughs> and I said, you know, it is so comforting for me to know that I could be replaced by a dog. <laughs> but uh, they do have a way of uh, worming their way into your, your lives. Well, as I thought about what I would share here this morning, I was looking at the passage of scripture that we looked at last week from Mark 11 and read ahead to Mark 12. and figured this may just be a good thing to continue in that passage that we were working on last week. And so I've entitled today's sermon, Trouble in the Vineyard. Uh, in the Broadway musical, The Music Man, there's a fast-moving, catchy song entitled Trouble. And the familiar chorus goes like this. Oh, we got trouble right here in River City, right here in River City, with a capital T. We surely got trouble, we surely got trouble right here in River City, right here. Well, in the story that Jesus tells here in Mark 12, that song could have been quite appropriate with just a few simple changes in the wording because there was a lot of trouble in the vineyard. This parable has variously been called the parable of the tenants or the parable of the vineyard or the parable of the absentee landlord. And it follows on the heels of Jesus' cleansing of the temple, of his cursing of the fig tree, and what happened here was that the, the, the religious leaders of that day were wondering and asked Jesus the question, by what authority, by whose authority are you doing these kinds of things? It upset them to no end that he would have the, the gall to go into the temple and overthrow the, the money changers' tables and, and say, my house has been uh, called a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. They didn't like that at all. And so this whole issue of divine authority came up. And if you'll turn back, if you have your Bibles open, to chapter 11 in verses 27 and 28, they arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking into the temple courts, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him, and they said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you the authority to do this? In a very real uh, sense, then, this parable uh, of the landlord, absentee landlord or the parable of the vineyard is a continuation of that discussion of this matter of authority and why did Jesus think that he had the right to exercise that kind of authority? And then Jesus made a deal with them. He says, if you'll answer my question, then I'll answer your question. And he says, was John's baptism from heaven or from men? And with that question, Jesus backed those religious leaders into a corner because he knew that if they said that John's authority came from God, then they'd have to recognize that his did as well. And if they said, well, John didn't have the authority from God, the people would rise up against them. And so they refused to answer his question. And Jesus kept his word and said, well, if you're not going to answer my question, then I'm not going to ask, answer yours as well. And so Jesus won that round, if you, if you would say that in that terms of, our, of the argument. That was very often Jesus' methodology. When people would raise a question, he wouldn't immediately answer the question. He would raise a question of his own and have them deal with what they were trying to uh, slander him uh, uh, for. And it was at this point that Jesus figured he would take that whole matter of his claim of being the Messiah a step for, uh, farther, and he tells this provocative story. 
tells the story of a landowner who had planted a very large vineyard and he completely fenced it in. He set up a watchtower to guard it against outside attacks and from wild animals. And while the landowner had uh, taken on a lot of this responsibility, there came the time where he said, you know, I'm ready to turn that responsibility over to somebody else. And he turned it over to some tenants and left it into their care. And all he asked in return is that when you come to harvest time, whatever the harvest produces, I will get a part of that and you will get a part of that. So harvest time came and the landover sent a, a, a servant to the vineyard to collect his share of the produce. And high in the watchtower, one of those tenants saw the servant approaching and instead of welcoming him uh, and handing over what would have been the rightful payment to the, uh, to the, the, uh, the vineyard owner, the tenants beat him. And uh, as word had reached the landowner, uh, of course, uh, he was naturally displeased. And so he sent some more servants to get his share. And the same thing happened. The servants were mistreated. One was beaten, one was killed, another was stoned. And finally, the landowner sent his son. And he thought, you know, they will respect my son because he's part of the family. And when the tenants saw the son approaching, they said amongst themselves, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and get his inheritance. And that's exactly what they did. The tenants killed the landowner's son. Now the message is quite clear and plain to understand for those who would have ears to hear. Jesus was pronouncing word of judgment upon those who would reject him as Messiah, as the Savior, as the Lord. And interestingly enough, this is one of uh, only seven other parables that are recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they all three agree in the meaning. The landowner is God, the vineyard is the Jewish nation, the renters are the religious leaders of the day, and the servants who were sent to collect the rent are the Old Testament prophets, and the son who was seized and killed is Jesus Christ. Jesus was talking autobiographically here, but more than that, he was giving a historic thumbnail sketch of God's dealings with his people. And all three gospel writers make it clear that the chief priests, the elders, and the Pharisees knew what Jesus was talking about and that he was talking about them. How tragic that parable so clearly, that is so clearly understood, could have resulted in a change of heart for these people, but it didn't. Instead, that it hardened their response of rejection, and they decided that they would still go ahead and carry out their cruel plan, which in the end resulted in the crucifixion of our Savior. This is a parable of judgment, a judgment that was based entirely on the person and the work of Jesus. And in giving this parable, Jesus ups the ante, so to speak, as he raises the question of whether or not the Jewish nation will accept him as Messiah and Savior or reject him in unbelief. And his question posed to the religious elites of that day are as pressing and relevant as they are today. For the question really is, what will you do with Jesus? What will I do with Jesus? The parable of Jesus has a lot to say among other things about his authority and about ownership. And in this parable, the tenants acted as though they owned the vineyard rather than the master. And even though the, the, the master had acted very generously and very patiently toward them, they failed to recognize that the ownership of the vineyard belonged to him. And it was his generosity toward them that should have been respected. As we've already noted that Jesus was talking about the people of Israel in this parable and how they rejected God by rejecting the prophets and then eventually God's own son. But I think this parable also has a special application to the church today and to those of us who claim that we have Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And when you stop and think about it, everything we have really is on loan from God. And yet so often we tend to kind of act like these are our things. We're the owners. And in preparing for this sermon, uh, I came across a, a very interesting story that I think aptly illustrates this truth. 
The story is told of an afternoon one secretary had worked in a large office building, took a, a well-deserved uh, coffee break, and she stopped by the vending machine and bought a bag of cookies and then slipped them in her purse, and then she waited in line for a cup of coffee. And after she got her coffee, she found a vacant uh, table and chair and sat down in the break room and sat down to enjoy a few minutes away from the office. Uh, she brought with her, her one of the latest women's magazines and she opened to an article that she had started reading earlier in the day during breakfast and after taking a sip of coffee, she reached out and took a cookie, cookie from the bag. To her astonishment, the man who came and sat across the table from her reached into the bag and he took a cookie as well. She was a little bit upset by this, but she didn't say anything for after all, it was only one cookie. A few minutes later, she took a cookie, and once again, her table companion reached in the bag, and he took a cookie as well. Now she was getting a little bit of bent out of shape, especially since there was only one more cookie left in the bag, and apparently the man had noticed that, and he reached in and took that other cookie and broke it in half and offered half to her and <laughs> took the other half himself. Then he smiled and rose from the table and walked away. By this time, she was, steam was coming out of her ears. How dare he ruin her coffee break like this by helping himself to her cookies. She hastily folded up her magazine and snatched up her purse, fell open and revealed an unopened pack of cookies. All this time she had been helping herself to somebody else's cookies <laughs> and he didn't even seem to mind. Actually it was the person with whom she was sharing the table who had every right to be offended. She had taken what belonged to him without asking and even acknowledging the generosity of her host. You know, that same kind of mistake with certainly decided, decided differently amounts of anger and violence was made by the tenants here in this vineyard in the parable that Jesus sets before us. The tenants didn't own the vineyard that they were working in, nor did they own the fruit that it possessed, uh, produced. As tenants, as sharecroppers, as we might call them today, they only had leased the land. They didn't pay the purchase price, they only paid rent. And when the rent was agreed upon, it would be a portion of the harvest. And that truth remains unchanged today. You see, God is the owner. We are merely the tenants. And yet so often we act like it's all ours. It's my money and I can spend it as I please. It's my body and I have a right to do with it what I want. It's my life and I don't need God or the church or anybody else to tell me how to run it. And that's an authority issue. That's as contemporary as April the 3rd, 2022. And so the crucial question is, who is in control? There are a number of parables that Jesus told that come under that category of management parables where the king goes away and leaves the servants to do the work while he's absent. They have the freedom to make their own decisions in the absence of the owner. And just like God left Adam be the manager of the earth to till it and subdue it, so God continually gives to all mankind this capacity, this freedom of will, this responsibility of making our own decisions. God's management style is, is, is not one of uh, riding hard over top of us. He has a hands-off approach. He's not looking over his shoulder, all, our shoulders all the time and constantly stepping in and correcting us and telling us where we've gone off course. He's given us the freedom to work things out on our own on this good earth. And so this parable then becomes quite enlightening and informative and even convicting. And as I look at this parable, I think it tells us a lot about a number of things. First of all, it tells us a lot about God. It tells us of God's trust in those people that he created. The owner of the vineyard entrusted to the tenants the responsibility to till the soil, to cultivate, to nourish it, to work for the best harvest possible since they would get a share in the profit. He didn't stand over them like a, uh, with a police-like uh, supervision. But he went away and he left them to do the task. And you see, God pays us the ultimate compliment when he made us in his own image and gave us the privilege of freedom of choice, of free will. 
So it, it tells us a lot about how God trusts people. It also tells us a lot about God's patience. The master sent the messenger after messenger, and uh, as uh, they were rudely and, and violently mistreated, one messenger after another, he, he gives those tenants chance after chance to respond and say, hey, this was a deal, let's, let's work it out. And so God bears with us, even when we sin and at times go off on our own. We read in Psalm 103, verses 8 and following, that the Lord is patient and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not always accuse us, nor do we harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. You see, God has given us this wonderful offer. Receive my son, accept my authority, and you will have life eternal. But if you choose to reject that, all that awaits is judgment and hell. So God is a God that is full of patience with his people. It tells us of God's trust in mankind. It tells us of his patience. But it also tells us of his judgment. In the end, the master of the vineyard took the vineyard from the tenants and gave it to others. God's eternal judgment is that when he takes out of our hands the, the task that he meant for us to do, it will go to somebody else. And people sink to their lowest level when they become useless to God and come under God's wrath and, and judgment by repeatedly ignoring his love and grace. My wife and I, oft times when we come home from church on Sunday morning, will watch on channel 49 the uh, worship service from uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church. Uh, probably 15, 20 years ago now, we had been at a workshop there and uh, had been appreciative of the ministry of that church and we have appreciated uh, Jonathan Falwell's uh, preaching skills. And uh, last week, he was preaching on this whole matter of heaven and hell. And uh, he had said what I have said at times too, that God doesn't send anybody to hell. People choose to go there because they reject his message of salvation. And so it tells us a lot about God. That God puts a lot of trust in us and gives us the choice of free will. I'm thankful that God didn't make us puppets, that our only choice was to choose him. He gave us the gift of free will. And so he put a lot of trust in people. He also has a lot of patience with us. And oh my goodness, I look back on my life and when I think of how I struggled with surrendering my life to Jesus as a nine-year-old boy, during that time there, we had a week-long series of revival services at the church that I was attending. And I remember all week long and the invitation was giving, I thought, oh my goodness, I, I need to give my life to Jesus. And yet I... I fought that until I think it was Saturday night and uh, I was just under such conviction I figured I can't stand this anymore I need to raise my hand and say I want Jesus to be my savior and uh, God was patient I recall too how in the summer between my 11th and 12th grade year in high school I felt God's called in a very direct way to a pastoral ministry and I had gone forward at a United Methodist, uh, at that time, probably it was an EUB camp meeting uh, that I attended with uh, another couple. Barbie and I were dating at that time, and we attended with another couple. And uh, uh, as the invitation was given to surrender our lives to full-time service for Jesus, uh, I remember going to the altar, and it was as clear as, uh, as it was when that sun came out a little while ago that God was calling me to pastoral ministry. And... Uh, I said, yes, Lord, but it was five years later that I finally said, okay, you win. Uh, like the hound of heaven, he pursued me, and uh, I knew that's where I needed to be. And it also tells us of God's judgment, that when we 
try to do things our way, there are consequences. And we miss out on the very best that God has to offer us. Secondly, it tells us a lot about man. It tells us first of human privilege. The vineyard was equipped with everything, the hedge, the wine, uh, wine press, the tower, everything that would have made the tasks easy for the tenants. And God not only gives us a task to do as Christians, but he gives us the means whereby that we can do it all. All of our lives though, we've been helping ourselves to God's bag of cookies. Whether we realize it or not, whatever cookies we have are cookies that come from God. And the truth of the matter is, we have been greatly blessed and gifted by God, so much so that we're without excuse. And so it tells us of the privileges we have and especially here in America, we are so blessed compared to the rest of the world. It also tells us, as I mentioned, of human freedom. The master left the tenants to do the tasks as they liked it. He wasn't a tyrannical task master. He's a wise counselor who allocates a task and then he trusts a person to do it. God is not a micromanager. We're not puppets, we make our own choice. It also tells us of human accountability. To all people there comes the day of reckoning. We're answerable for the way we treat God's son and for the way in which we carry out the tasks that God gives us. But sadly it also tells us of the deliberateness of human sin. The tenets very deliberately chose a policy of rebellion and disobedience toward the master. And sin has that way of working into our lives of that uh, very deliberate opposition to God. We take our own way rather than to follow the way of God. And so it tells not a very good picture of what we are like. Uh, you know, uh, when we look in the mirror and realize our basic sinful nature, it's not a pretty picture. But then, thirdly, it tells us so much about Jesus, and this is where the good news comes to the story. It tells us of the claim of Jesus, shows us quite clearly that Jesus was lifting himself up as a part of that succession of the prophets, and that those who had come before him were messengers of God. No one could deny that honor. But they were servants. He was the Son. The parable contains one of the clearest claims ever that Jesus made to be unique and to be different from the greatest of all those who went before him. And here Jesus was asserting his divine authority, his claim to be the Messiah. And so it tells us of the claim of Jesus, but it also tells us of the sacrifice of Jesus and how appropriate that we think about the sacrifice of Jesus during this Lenten season. It makes it clear that Jesus knew what lie ahead of him. In the parable, the hands of the wicked men killed the son, and Jesus knew full well that he had come to die and that he would give his life a ransom for the sins of the world. We do well to point out a fallacy, a heresy that has made makes its rounds and has been making its rounds in some of the peace churches and Anabaptist churches known as the nonviolent atonement. And they teach that it was never God's intent that Jesus would come and suffer that violent, ugly death on the cross. That God had sent Jesus to be a good example to us and that God's plan went awry when the religious leaders of that day rose up against Jesus and crucified him. And as I said, it's a heresy because Jesus died and shed his blood as the perfect lamb of God to save us. He went willingly and open-eyed to the cross to provide for our salvation and our eternal life. As we noted at the outset, there's a lot of trouble in River City. And you know, there's a lot of trouble in Lancaster in White Horse, in Strasburg, in Gap. And to bring it even closer, there's a lot of trouble at Peckway EC Church. And even closer, there's a lot of trouble in our lives. 
Sin has made a mess of things. And only God can straighten out that mess that we've got ourselves into. But for that to happen, we need to give up control. We need to surrender control of our lives to Jesus Christ. You see, there's really only two alternatives in life before God. We either become brokenhearted and repentant and place our faith in Jesus, or we have a hard-hearted rejection of him. They're the only two alternatives. And as there are only two alternatives in life, there are only two alternatives in death. Either everlasting glory and bliss in heaven or eternal suffering in hell. And so either we die in the death of Jesus, giving up our control and live forever, or we choose to live our own lives apart from Jesus Christ. And when we have physical death, we are then ushered into a spiritual death of eternal separation from God. There are no third options, whether in life or in death. To reject the Son that the Father sent is to bring about jam damnation and judgment. And the tenants in this parable were condemned not because they were the worst tenants in the neighborhood, not because their harvest was poor. They were condemned because they had rejected the owner's servants, and last of all, they rejected his son. And it is in the rejection of his son, and only in the rejection, that judgment comes. And that's the significance then of verses 10 and 11, when Jesus asked them, have you not read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and this is marvelous in our eyes. We don't want to be like the builders this morning who rejected Jesus Christ. We don't want to stumble over this rejected stone, for the very stone the, re the builders rejected has become the significant capstone, the cornerstone. His last word from the vineyard owner here is that there is a choice. And if we choose to reject the Son, there is nothing left but judgment. There's no other way to the Father than through Jesus Christ. There's salvation in no other name but the wonderful, blessed name of Jesus. And you may be sitting here this morning and saying, praise God, I have not rejected the Son. I know where I'm going. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when I pass from this earth, I will go to heaven. And that's wonderful. And I celebrate that with you, and I'm so glad that I have that assurance myself as well. But then I raise the question, what about others around us who do not know Jesus? Wilmer, I was encouraged by your word of testimony this morning of just helping that person know that God cares. Evangelism I heard years ago, and I think it's the best of end it, a definition of evangelism I've ever heard, that evangelism is helping to move one, a person one step closer to Jesus Christ. And if you look at your life, as I look at mine, it wasn't that some one day I had this epiphany and like that, I accepted Jesus. You look back and there were many other people that were having influence in your life, that spoke truth to your life. And then you came to that moment of decision. And so it's imperative that as we look at this parable that we understand that we should celebrate the fact that we did not reject the vineyard owner, but there are still others that are, and we need to tell them the truth. God came to his own, the scriptures say, and his own received him not. But to as many as receive him, they will become the children of God. The beloved Son of God, who came knowing full well that he would be rejected and crucified, willingly offered his life as an atoning sacrifice for your sin and for mine. And so we get back to the question I raised at the very beginning. What will you do with Jesus?
Father in heaven, we realize that it was our sin, our rebelliousness, that required the cross of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you that you so loved us that you gave. You gave your one and only Son to be our Savior so that we could have the promise of eternal life. Thank you for this very clear message of how our decisions in this life determine our eternal destiny. And Father, may you challenge us to first of all make sure that we are in the fold. We are uh, a part of that body of uh, a great company of believers who will spend eternity with Jesus. And we thank you for that assurance for those of us who have it. And Father, if there are any here who don't have that strong assurance, who do not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are your children and headed for eternity with you, may this be their day of decision. But beyond that, Lord, we pray that you would motivate our hearts and our lips and our actions to speak truth to those around us who do not know Jesus, to point them to the Savior, and that by our words and by our lives, we would help people move one step closer to Jesus so they too can have that full assurance of eternity. For we ask it all in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Will. Please rise if you're able.